Hi, I'll unmute myself and I'll keep this relatively brief. Uh, by the way, Maurice, I've poured myself a nice glass of red wine because you made me very thirsty the other day when we spoke. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll try and keep this very brief because there's such a, a vast career to um, sum up. Uh, and Maurice is one of the most exciting artists working in any medium today. And this work totally defies easy definition, but I'm going to attempt it nonetheless in my introduction, fueled by a very nice glass of French red. Uh, and I'm going to do this by listing a totally arbitrary number of highlights from a very, very career, uh, most of which he actually will discuss today. So uh, who is Maurice? He's an artist, curator, collaborator, teacher, theorist. Uh, back in 1991, he co-created the first HD computer animated series, Quarks which I'll come back to at the end, which explored strange invisible creatures bending the laws of physics, biology, optics, themes that would uh, recur and be revisited in various forms in, in many of his later works. And again, these, these are uh, almost randomly picked highlights. 1995, Tunnel Under the Atlantic linked the Pompidou Centre in Paris with the Museum of Contemporary Art in Montreal, and it enabled hundreds of visitors to both galleries each day to engage with each other through this piece of what could very glibly be called interactive sculpture. Um, 97's World Skin placed visitors in an immersive space, which was comprised of a collage of photographs and sequences from news reports of different theaters of war. And the visitors were invited to take pictures, enabling them to actually wipe out sections of the projected images. As more and more participants took pictures, the projections became empty. And so the visitors, in a way, altered the landscape of war through their participation. Uh, 2005's Cosmopolis, um, 12 cities are captured in a way that's completely surprising to the participant. And I use the term participant rather than the term spectator, as the term spectator is actually completely inadequate to experience the, uh, to, to describe the experience of, of viewing Maurice's work. A uh, giant immersive interactive installation brings the world closer while at the same time it critiques our differences from scientific, sociological and artistic perspectives. He uh, had a long form project called the Mechanics of Emotion, which grew out of the idea that the internet is the world's nervous system and that messages sent between users can cross zones of pain and pleasure. And that's actually a quote from Maurice there. Uh, using various analytical and graphic tools in, in his ever-evolving technical arsenal, he mapped the world's emotions. In one part, he created a series of frozen feelings, machine-made sculptures of digitally carved discs and various materials. He also beat an uh, built an emotional vending machine that dispenses musical cocktails based on your selected emotions. His recent work, uh, Value of Values in the Blockchain, and the clues in the title there, uh, he worked in collaboration with fellow artists Tobias Klein and Nicholas mendoza Leal, uh, experimenting with blockchain-enhanced transactional art. And I know he's, he's going to discuss it at some depth today. Uh, but it used EEG and biofeedback, trying to appraise human values, letting the visitors use their brainwaves to turn abstract concepts such as freedom, money, peace, love, power, into three-dimensional images. Um, these images are then registered on a blockchain and converted into Ethereum, a form of cryptocurrency. And so the visitor actually becomes the owner of that image, which they can now sell or barter. Uh, this was inspired, he said, by a license plate that sold for $1 million and interrogates the subjective values of objects and the nature of our transactions with art. And you can trace Maurice's work right back to the mischievous work of iconoclasts such as Marcel Duchamp and The Fountain, an early form of interactive and playful subversion of artistic expression. So this, I'm going to conclude now, is a brief and really subjective overview of a life's work that employs various media, including combining video, computer graphics, immersive virtual reality, the internet, performance, EEG, 3D printing, large-scale urban media art, installations and interactive exhibitions. And the, the list of technologies and, and methodologies are constantly evolving even as we speak. This work is playful, witty, profound, interactive, most importantly accessible, and constantly evolving like those strange little creatures in 3D animation quarks. Far too vast to be summed up in this very hasty introduction, and I hope I haven't talked too fast, but I will hand over to Maurice and raise a glass to him.
Tom, it's uh, uh, I think after what you have said, uh, I don't need to talk. <laughs> May I use your voiceover on my slides? <laughs> because you no, okay. said everything and even more. Uh, yeah, I, I work is, for wine, by the way, so I, you can pay me in wine. So. <laughs> I see, I see. You're negotiating our next uh, wine tasting party. <laughs> So, thank you very much uh, for this uh, introduction. Thank you, Delma, for inviting me and us, all of us, because it's always a pleasure to see uh, new and old friends. And, uh, and uh, I'm very happy of this uh, opportunity. So, for me, it's a bit late, but it's still okay, uh, because I'm in Hong Kong presently. So, uh, for me, it's something like 10.30, maybe, yeah. 1030 past something. Uh, okay, so yes, I will come back uh, to some of the points you mentioned uh, because we, uh, we decided to make it as one talk, but really feel, feel free to say, oh, I would like to ask a question and uh, I will honestly interrupt. Uh, I will feel better. And, and then as we'll talk about very different uh, I will talk about very different topic. It may be interesting to have a, uh, to have a in between question. Uh, just one minute. I'm asking for something to drink, uh, not wine. <laughs> Otherwise, it will become difficult. Uh, okay. So, uh, should I start sharing? Very happy. So I share, I share what? Why is it? Oh, okay. Sorry, I have to open it because I think I did. Uh... <laughs> okay, here. Uh, so, yeah, you know, I'm used to say uh, 30 years of practice and so on. And then uh, I discovered that it's closer to 40 now, uh, which is not good. I mean, I like uh, round numbers, but uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, yeah, too much, too many years. So anyway, I, I will separate my talk in three parts. Uh, and each part will mention how I uh, do, I create an extension of my artwork as educational matter, uh, how I involve students uh, in, uh, in the process and I open to uh, other, uh, other possibility of creation. So that's, uh, uh, I just would like to remove, because I have every, I like to have everybody in the middle of my screen, but I don't see the slides. <laughs> okay. So, yes, uh, I don't know. It seems that uh, I cannot. Ah, better. Sorry, I hope you don't mind, but I hide you. Okay, so, uh, yes, uh, I started before the quarks making a lot of uh, video installation, video artworks, uh, video about art also. And then uh, in the, at the end of the 80s, I started to work with computer, 3D computer graphics. And I thought it would be interesting to do something with uh, my friend Francois Coyton and Benoit Peters, who are uh, two amazing, uh, amazing comics uh, uh, creators. And, um, and that was really fantastic to have this collaboration. And so, I wanted to do something that for some people became uh, the image of what 3D computer graphics could be, one of the form. Uh, but actually, it was uh, a kind of a critical perspective. As I wanted to talk about truth, I wanted about to talk about the scientific truth. What does it mean to do some kind of realistic image? And you may not understand, but at this time, it's looked very realistic. Uh, of course, compared to what we can do now, it's uh, totally outdated. Um, and then uh, I wanted to do something about 
new explanation of uh, the, the universe. Yeah, we have to start with something. And so started to do this series because I wanted it to, to, be, to uh, be displayed in prime time on TV. This is what happened two times on uh, Canal Plus in France and uh, in, in like 12 different countries around the world. The time um, has come this was for me to reveal everything I know about quarks. It, it was scientific documentary. And, uh, These strange I'm not, beings I'm not really which really showing you the, the series laws. or any kind of a uh, long video about that. Uh, but uh, I tried to play with the ambiguity. Uh, and of course, the, what we can do as soon as we don't have to respect the law of physics, biology, optic and so on. The elastofragmentoplast. So the, the quarks had, all of them had different names and they are invisible and they have been discovered by uh, a researcher in uh, cryptobiology, comparative, comparative cryptobiology. And so here you see the elastofragmentoplast. You discover later, you understand later that it explains why you find objects broken. Uh, and it's well, sorry, too difficult to say. <laughs> this is a mnemochrome that explains uh, plagiarism in painting. And this is a spatio, this is a spiro thermophage. Uh, but no, sorry, it's an error on the slide. This is a spatio striata. And the spatio striata has slices of space where it doesn't exist. This is a reverso chronocycle uh, where uh, that. Uh, when it's here, the time goes backward. The electricia that explain many things related to light and, uh, and so other things. So for me, it was very exciting to discover new tools to produce image and to, um, to see what we could do and say with that. Uh, and I was very surprised because it was very successful. Uh, and maybe not for the, the reason I was expecting. So anyway, personally, I was expecting something else. That was virtuality. What I mean with that, because of course it sounds very logical, or I don't know, kind of evolution of technology. But I, I was not in, into so much into technology or evolution of technologies. I was more... Uh, trying to figure out what are the real mutation of society and what, uh, how artists can, can maybe modify their way of producing artworks. And so um, when I say missing virtuality, I mean that uh, a recorded movie, animation, live action or whatever, is something that is supposed to be always the same, even if people can interpret it differently. And so the linearity uh, of the video was not satisfying for me. And, and the quarks were conceived are uh, processual uh, entities. So they could, they could uh, uh, they evolve around, uh, around cycles and, uh, and things that could be generated automatically. So I wanted people to interact with them, what I couldn't do at the time. But... The, the tools of, for VR evolved, and you have seen yesterday, and Monica and Wolfgang, and, uh, and, and maybe and probably Roy also mentioned this kind of thing, and, uh, uh, and many other people, of course. Uh, at the end of the 80s and beginning of the 90s, people started to use VR, but they was not satisfied because they was expecting something uh, with uh, texture. It was not about volumes, that, uh, because this is what I was trying to avoid in the, uh, with computer graphics. And so I, I, I just waited until it was possible to use textures. Uh, so in 92, I proposed a collection of contemporary art made of uh, virtual reality artwork uh, that was art after a museum. And that was a great opportunity for me because I got uh, the... Uh, uh, the Villa Medicis uh, Award uh, of the, the French government. And so I could travel abroad and, uh, and meet a lot of people and, and talk with the artists to see if they would like to contribute to this project and so on. 
So this was very simple. And then later I discovered that this was very close to what was created at the same time in Chicago, uh, EVL. So it looks like a cave. And it was the same uh, idea in terms of uh, apparatus, what I called later SAS, S-A-S, uh, from the French word that means uh, uh, that means um, filtering, uh, screening, a screen to separate gold from sand, but also air to, from water in French. And so uh, the SAS is for me uh, the interface to access a universe which is not necessarily uh, a very sympathetic universe. It's not the one where we can breathe. Uh, the normal way, even if uh, later uh, Char Davis with Osmos uh, created work where you navigate by breathing. So in 95, uh, so I, ma I made a few uh, VR works and I won't get into these works. So the big questions, is God flat, is the devil curved, and what about me? Uh, and then in 95, I did this installation called the Tunnel Under the Atlantic. So it was between the Pompidou Center in Paris at the bottom uh, and uh, in the Museum of Contemporary Art in Montreal at the top. It was for ICI 95, and I'm very glad that 25 years after uh, ICI is again in Montreal. And so the, the principle was quite simple. You say, there are 6,000 kilometers between Paris and Montreal. People could communicate with something. Uh, people, uh, uh, some works, uh, telematic uh, works, uh, allowed to, uh, to dialogue and to talk. But I wanted another kind of experience. I wanted the experience to be more uh, into uh, working with the obstacles. And so for me, the obstacle, at the time of the tunnel was the culture. And so I created a, a volumes, cubes, made of culture. And if you dig into them, it's like digging into memory. You find fragments all around you. And you can talk with the person on the other side about what you see. At this time, they couldn't meet each other, they couldn't see each other, they could talk, and the voice gave the direction where to go. Uh, it, it took five days before they meet, but it was possible to meet because they introduced a video loading inside the VR centers. And this is the first meeting after five days. We can see you in Montreal. Everybody say hello. You're dressed in red with a white color. I couldn't, I couldn't expect more from this experience uh, because people used to come uh, something like one or two hours a day and come every day until the moment until the time they could meet. And that was really magic. It was very intense. Uh, and the interesting thing for me, it was to reveal how the fatigue function of communication would become, uh, would lead the, the nature of the communication later. This is exactly what I, uh, I, was, I had in mind. And this is what happened. You can see, they have been they have spent hours of digging they meet and then they have nothing more to say than oh i can see you you're dressed in red with a white color and this is very close to what alfred hitchcock uh, called the MacGuffin. you know the, this thing that nobody knows what it is but everybody is running after so the, the, to be in touch, that the fatigue function of communication, to establish the communication, to maintain it. So to be in touch is more important than to convey a message. So the message, of course, McLuhan would have said, uh, the, the, the message is uh, the apparatus itself uh, with what it means in how you 
put people together. I used to talk about architecture of communication at this time. Uh, but this was, uh, this was one of the parts. The other one was a kind of an opposite of a communication highway uh, people were talking about. So this is in 95. So for all the young people around us, uh, we have to explain that in 95, you had maybe one person for 100,000 having, having, having internet. It was the very beginning of the web. And, and so uh, to be immediately uh, into um, to be immediately into a VR environment with this kind of complex interaction and video inside VR, that was quite uh, unusual. So the yeah, what I, I could say. Let me. Uh, I need. Yeah. Oh, there is a problem with this slide. Uh, maybe I should because. There is something very important, uh, and I, I, I will talk about that for my talk in, uh, in Montreal. Uh, something very important to understand. Uh, what I wanted is a fully virtualized world. That means a world where everything or 90% of the content would be produced in real time and would depend on, on what happens. So we wouldn't be able to control this evolution. Uh, so the architecture itself is a result of digging. So I cannot control the people. So they decide to go in one direction, another one to come back, and so on. That's the result. The architecture is not pre-designed. Uh, the dialogue and the sound are exist in space. So you give the direction and so on. So it was specialized sound. Of course, I couldn't control the dialogue. And the sound itself was a composition that was dynamically uh, re rebuilt according to what people do. So it was a kind of form of generative music I've been doing work uh, on later. Uh, the real-time video chat, chat inside VR, that was uh, crazy. And I can tell you it's still difficult to do. Uh, that, uh, that's the weird thing. Uh, we did it in 95 and still difficult to do. Uh, some very important thing is a get a uh, The get a is coming from an expression from Quebec, uh, which is, c'est uh, arrangé par le get That means it has been made so by uh, the filmmaker. Because the filmmaker wants to succeed. And so uh, they, I use a kind of uh, primitive artificial intelligence uh, to organize the content according to the visitor's behavior. So I analyze constantly where they stop, where they look at, where they dig in. And uh, I would choose the next picture, uh, the next content according to, uh, to what they see and what they pay attention to. So uh, in the beginning, the space is empty. It's like a, a sugar cube, sugar cube box with no cube except where people are digging. And then other cubes come when uh, uh, when we need them. And so their content, each cube has a specific image. Their content is uh, decided at the last minute according to the experience of the previous one. Uh, so, uh, at the same time, I had also a virtual video director inside the, the, the program, the software. So, uh, so, I created automatically a documentary with four virtual cameras following the people, listening to the sound, to, to the dialogue, and also showing what they see. Uh, and I have 21 hours recorded of this experience, which is a fantastic video that has been digitized recently. And so uh, and it's still an amazing document because you see how people react. Let's go forward. Uh, you still can interrupt me if you want. So feel free to do so. Uh, turn it around the world. That, at the very beginning, I thought I should do something like that. And so in 2012, I, I was uh, 
invited uh, for four different exhibitions. Uh, the one in Seoul Museum of Art, uh, the, the Media City Seoul, the one Biennial in San Jose, uh, in California, the SAT in Montreal, and I have people in New York, Paris, Stockholm, and also, of course, we had one in Hong Kong because I was installed in Hong Kong at this time. And so people were digging into a content which was coming from the French Museum because I had a big collection of images coming from them. And I invited my students to interact with the scene. And uh, I think it's an interesting situation. Uh, so this is my student in Hong Kong, first year student. They are young, What it was about, and I didn't tell them how to interact. It was just in front of the screen, they lied, and then I just told them, I need you to interact, and I will record a video. I did it. Uh, and I discovered plenty of things with this video. First, as you can see, there are five of them. Uh, and and the uh, interaction with the Kinect was only tracking one. The second thing is they had the feeling to be totally immersed. When, as you can see, it was not in the dark. They were not surrounded by the image. They had the feeling that they were really uh, in interaction with them. And uh, of course, they could go from one place to another. Here they go to Montreal. Then later they will go to they will go to Seoul, in Korea, South Korea, and they, I didn't expect at all this kind of behavior. And this happened because I taking only one information from them, which is the distance. How far are they from the screen? This is the only thing I take, and so because of that. Even if you use your arms, you're actually uh, modifying slightly the behavior of the image. Of course, they missed totally the point that was more about express what interests you and you will discover the people that you like without asking for. And here they are in touch with uh, the curator in a uh, And they say, in Korean, the only sentence they know, which is, I love you. So that's, uh, that's a tunnel around the world, some extension of the tunnel. So I did, but I'm not going to talk only about the tunnel. In 2016, for, that was for the, uh, 20 years of the tunnel. I made. I had a show in uh, Osage Gallery in Hong Kong, and I presented a kind of skeleton of the original tunnel. Because for the original tunnel, I needed a big pipe, just because uh, the projectors were not powerful enough, and I couldn't be in daylight with projectors like uh, 800 lumens that were the maximum we could get at the time. Uh, so now we don't need that. We can have ambient light and uh, open surface. And I like this idea of being like uh, elephant uh, symmetry. So uh, it would be uh, it would be uh, the kind of uh, what remains of the experience of the past. And so this is a color tunnel, and people dig into colors, and they, uh, the information, of course, uh, come from the web. And they see the relation between color, colors and political things, for example. In Hong Kong, if you get red, you have the red flag of Hong Kong, but you have the Chinese red flag, and so on. Here, this is uh, the border tunnel. And so the border tunnel is about images that are collected on the web uh, in relation to the term border and uh, with everything related to the name of a country. 
And so uh, people could talk from one end to the other end of the tunnel like that. This is also the color tunnel. And this is a border tunnel. And then uh, the year after, I did uh, with my students, uh, we uh, did a, a project called uh, Borders Diggers, uh, where I invited them to make a project where they would define what can be the obstacle in communication and, and to create a, a real situation. Uh, the, the show, uh, we had a, a big show actually, <laughs> it was a big, a big museum in, in Nanjing. And this museum was connected to the School of Creative Media in Hong Kong. And so both sides, they could experiment these works uh, dealing with, uh, with uh, obstacles in communication. So one of them, for example, was the age. Another one was a kind of distortion happening uh, when the sound is uh, coming from specific events uh, become very disturbing and so on. And, and so they, uh, they did, uh, they did uh, many projects here. And I like to use, in this case, I, I use uh, the apparatus as a, as a creative device open to any kind of content, but still with uh, something connected to the original project, which was uh, this idea of uh, digging through a cycle and what does it mean to be connected. So you can imagine that between Hong Kong and, uh, and, uh, and Nanjing, this is uh, quite meaningful. Maurice, this is uh, yes. just, Justin Trigger here um, from the US. I, I have a conceptual question because I find the, all these projects fascinating. And I think there's wait, a... Wait, wait a minute, I yes. would like to see you. I stop, I stop sharing, <laughs> yes. <Okay. laughs> um, I, it's a conceptual question, um, which kind of pertains to all of these, and I'm curious about the choice. So you clearly at a certain point decided to tie all of these projects to the idea of digging or subterranean tunnels. And it seems to me that's a very deliberate choice. And I'm curious if you considered alternate means of transport, meaning through the sky or, for instance, other things. And I'm, I'm curious just how about that choice yeah. and why you connected, why you <laughs> focused on tunnels in relationship to this yeah. kind of interactive uh, telematic I, I can piece. tell you. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when, I, when I was at the beginning of my work with VR, I used to show some previous VR works, one called Is God Flat? And, um, and the first question I wonder before starting making this project was, should the VR be full or empty, the VR space. And I thought, okay, if I have an empty space, that means I see everything. So I have, I have nothing to expect. Why, why should I move in an empty space? But if the, the space is full, I would like uh, its architecture to result from my motion. I want me as a visitor to exist for the space. And so the first one was a universe full of bricks. And when you move, you have corridors that are dug in the direction where you go. And then you understand that you're building a labyrinth, a maze in which you are lost. And it's a kind of metaphor of life uh, because there is no end in this labyrinth, but it's just for you, like a Kafka door uh, in the chateau, you know, in the castle. So that was a starting point. But when I did that, two weeks after, I was asked to make a project with, uh, with Montreal, and, and, and I was asked to use uh, Is God Flat to make that. And I said, I'm sorry, uh, this doesn't make any sense in connecting people with the same infrastructure. You have to conceive something else. And, and in the night, after a few glasses of uh, lemonade, uh, we decided that uh, the good idea would be to dig a tunnel inside culture. So the tunnel under the Atlantic is not in the ground. It's not dug in the ground. It's dug into culture. 
So culture, same thing. I'm not showing a catalog of pictures. Uh, so I want people, it's like a block of marble, you know, you don't know what is inside. And if you dig, you see the side, the, the detail of the drawing that has been extruded. And, and this, uh, this became interesting for a plastician artist, you know, you want to work with matter in a way. And I like this uh, immaterial materiality uh, that was quite, um, quite exciting. And, and I thought, okay, now if I have a big obstacle like that between two people, what would happen if they try to communicate? And so, the, you know, everything, it's never one idea at a time. They all come more or less together, but with a certain logic. And so the logic was this one. I didn't want the world to be, em to be empty. So this is why what I did at this time didn't look like what other people used to do by adding object and, and sink in space. Uh, because for me, this was uh, a kind of a basic thing. I, I, I used, I, I've been working with computer graphics with, before, you know, so I was already fighting for something, you know, with some, uh, some ideas about that. So, uh, yeah. I wanted to experience this uh, new form of plasticity uh, of uh, VR. And I could have, um, yeah, definitely the tunnel would make no sense, uh, no sense at all if it would be in the sky. <laughs> oh, I have to say that after it got flat, that was a kind of underground brick environment. That mean, what does it mean that God is a, in a world made of bricks? Uh, that means somebody came before, <laughs> maybe humans. And, and the second one was, is the devil curved? And the devil was in the sky, but the sky was opaque. So you still, uh, you still have to dig. And there is a creature in the sky that, that had, this was a, a real neural network thing. It was in 94. Uh, and uh, it was really interesting to have this thing reacting to us. And it was a metaphor of prime time TV programs uh, trying to seduce the people by any means. So yeah, maybe I should have shown some samples, but uh, I would have the feeling to, to show the same kind of thing I used to show in the 90s. So I, I would like to go to, <laughs> to the next one. Did, yeah. did I reply your question? Yeah, and I have a follow-up that we can talk about at the end of your presentation, but thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, so I share again. Uh, where is it? Damn it. Um, I told you. Too many, <laughs> I, I should have, uh, okay, I have it. Okay, so let's go backward to a, a kind of a more classic works of mine uh, called Wellskin, a photo of in the land of war on 97. So this one, uh, I, I worked, it was not the first time, but close to the first time I worked with Jean-Baptiste Barrière, the, the composer. Uh, and we, uh, we presented this uh, work that was commissioned by uh, our Teletronica Center. Uh, and it's a cave work. So caves, you have to understand that it means that it's a cube with projection around it. So it's the name of the device. It's not... Uh, uh, either uh, the prehistorical thing or the, uh, or the Plato's cave, even if it could be. So, um, yeah. Oh, sorry. I have, to, I have to tell you two words before. So the, the, you have a group of people, usually from three to eight, uh, and you give them cameras and you tell them you're a group of tourists. Look at you you're gonna make a photo safari in the land of war. And so they, have, they are given photo cameras up to three. And so that they can take photos. And this is what they will do. 
So this is the very first video recorded on the computer, the development computer. Very bad quality, as you can see. And uh, what you see, the world is made of uh, the world is made of photos of the Second World War and the Bosnia War. It was during the Bosnia War. And when people take photos, what they take is erased from the scene and is printed out so they can get the print. But what they get is not available anymore for the others. Uh, we should have a, uh, we should have sound. So, oh, okay, sorry. I forgot to do this. Uh, oh no, I have share computer sound, okay. Sorry, I should come back. I think one of the videos is missing. Okay, we've seen this one. Okay, no, that's it. Uh, so here you see a group of people inside, but I don't understand why we don't have sound. Uh, the sound is very important. Uh, as you can see, people have stereoscopic glasses, so they don't see the like, something like the uh, wallpaper uh, moving on the wall. Uh, they have the feeling to be in the middle of the space, uh, which is totally different. Let's see the next one. I don't know if I have three. No, okay. Uh, here, but uh, the, it's a pity we didn't have the sound. Uh, ah, may, maybe, sorry. Let me come back to the first one. Maybe it was longer. Yeah, just to see, yeah, that the situation. Um, do I have the sound here? No, no sound. Okay. Maybe I've been muted or what? Maurice, we can hear the computer audio. Okay. Uh, we had the sound before, so I don't understand. Uh, anyway, you see, groups can be bigger. The interesting thing, because I didn't want to have uh, goggles, VR goggles, uh, so uh, here people can see their body and can see the other people. The sound of the camera becomes gradually a gun sound and so when they shoot at the beginning it looks very innocent then it becomes like killing people but there are ghosts remaining and these ghosts are here to tell you that uh, don't imagine that you won't leave any trace uh, maybe some of you are not aware of the fact that Linz is actually where the uh, after Congress is what happens, it's actually most of the city of Africa. Uh, so, uh, where I was young, and this, of course, makes uh, more sense to understand this. Okay. Uh, where am I? Okay, we've seen this one. So, you see the photos people make. Uh, what have been taken by other people uh, is not doesn't appear on the on the photo, so it becomes something very specific. A very different work from two thousand five, uh, but I say different and not different. So I, I'm skipping something like twenty or thirty different works in between. Um, this one is also about watching. But instead of erasing, it's about adding and sharing. And it's coming from a series of works uh, called uh, Collective Retinal Memory, where um, in, the, in 2000, at the Pompidou Center, I presented a show called Art Impact, where people could use binoculars and see a contemporary art show in Avignon, in the south of France, 
the day before the opening, and they could paint with what they see or what they look at. Seeing is one thing, looking at as another level of intentionality, and this is uh, the objective. So in 2005, I was asked to make an uh, installation for the French year in China. Uh, and so uh, I've never been to China before, uh, and uh, I had a very short time, I had three months to make it. Uh, so I decided to create a, a sturdy telescopes, VR telescopes, in order to uh, allow the people to see, to watch cities around the world. So that was a project, as I proposed it after one week. Uh, it was 12 telescopes, 12 screens creating a panorama, uh, and each telescope was were presenting uh, a different city with five or six different panoramas. The panoramas were not tourist panoramas. They were actually panoramas to show how cities evolve. And, and a lot of other content in the show was explaining why this was evolving that way. So this is in Shanghai, uh, when the Hutong uh, were destroyed to create new buildings and so the collective retinal memory uh, is a, a very simple concept uh, about what we usually don't share and uh, what, uh, what happens Au concept de mémoire rétinienne collective. Ce que l'on regarde, c'est sur quoi notre regard s'attarde, vient se peindre sur le panorama central. Uh, so Les lunettes capturent le mouvement du regard pour le coucher cities. à la surface de l'écran, uh, comme le ferait l'aérographe ou la bombe de peinture du tagueur. So sur l'écran, les regards se mêlent pour constituer it's une vision dynamique et évanescente de la ville-monde en perpétuelle mutation. C'est un palimpseste sur lequel s'écrit la mémoire fugace de l'expérience urbaine. La mémoire rétinienne collective a déjà. So this is the installation itself. When we tested it in France, in Villa Coublet, before sending it to China, because the trip was two or three months, and so we had to we had to check everything before sending. So you see, it looks pretty close to the original project. And, and, uh, and the light is only on the people. That was a very important thing. This is a science museum where it was presented at first. Uh, so the, this is a Shanghai uh, science museum because I needed a big room, something like, this one is 2000 square meters. Uh, and the interesting thing is that I got up to um, more than 10,000 people a day coming. Uh, that was the biggest uh, success before the, the World Expo that came after. At the same time, I had a very different show in the gallery, uh, uh, very different. Here we had everybody in the other, we had only the art world. So that was really interesting to have simultaneously uh, two experiences like that. And what I loved, and, and this probably contributed to my choice to go to Asia, is the public. You will see later why. So this exhibition was presented uh, as the opening exhibition of the Three Gorge Museum in Chongqing, in the center of China. Uh, and this is the opening, the opening ceremony, of course, for the museum as well, not only for the show, but I like to like this, to show these pictures because I was expecting everything but that. And so what was fantastic was uh, this, to see how Full families came, people stayed time they needed to see what they wanted. And you had uh, people from, from two to, to, to 100 years old.
And so this is uh, just a sample of uh, what was recorded, but we use only the middle of middle stripe of it, not, not the full uh, things of the collective retinal memory. That was the path of the people as I planned it. And it works pretty well. So that's uh, for the part one, but I already took more than half of the time. Uh, where am I in the time? Delma, can you tell me? Y, eh, quedan oh, unos... yeah. Okay, I have to go faster. Okay. Part uh, y... two, urban media art. I started in 2002 to work on project in the city. I was invited by the Art Center Nabi to do something in Zorro. And I proposed to do this, put boxes like that in the street and wait for people to come to look inside the box. And they are asked to send warning message to the world. So they, uh, they write messages and they send them by uh, text. And, and this is like, uh, you got messages like save the whales, don't pollute and so on. So what people didn't notice immediately is the fact that when they look inside the box, their eye is watching the world. So they become immediately big brothers as a way to remind that uh, we want to know everything about the others and we want to preserve our privacy. In the gallery, we had a box like that where it was possible to get into the box and it was like to be in the plateau, plateau's cave uh, with a kind of shadowy environment and sometimes a face coming an eye watching and definitely finding it's not exciting, but actually inside the box, it's us. So it's a different feeling. 2004, same topic in Athens for the Olympic games in the street. So that was also in the street, but uh, it happened something totally different here. Uh, first, plenty of people. And second, uh, it, there were a delay of seven seconds for the, for the Wi-Fi. And so people could do something and see it on the screen. So they were playing with that. And actually it was a totally different project. Near Horizon, we go back to China. This is uh, in uh, 2008. Uh, no, oh, where is the horizon? Yeah, that's an urban installation. And uh, oh, I have a sign now. <laughs> I have no explanation. Okay, uh, so I was finishing an uh, installation in uh, Central Korea Avenue in uh, Pudong. The Roy uh, probably will work on ice. Uh, and I decided to do this kind of weird red And uh, the idea was quite simple. This is what I call the ID wall. Swallowing people's identity. And so they converted people into two and um, the, this came after my work at, uh, on Cosmopolis. And when I saw people working in the, in the buildings, building, making the buildings, and living in the basement during the construction, and then going back to the, uh, to the countryside. So there were not the people living in the building. And so they can use, they get, they get the QR code, they can use it. Uh, on the web, they could find themselves and so on. And at the same time, we had this screen where the city was growing, ever growing city. And the city is paved with QR code. And so that means paved uh, with the idea of the, of the visitors. So they become the city. That was uh, kind of a simple concept. And uh, yeah, 
En het afkozen ziet iets, hè? Die kan nog niet Ik kan het niet doen. Uh, let's go to next. I have to come back. So this is a, uh, I made a series called Mechanics of Emotions, which is a series of uh, something like 15 or 20 different works, installations, and, uh, and uh, as Tom said, uh, um, emotion bending machines and, uh, and uh, frozen feelings and uh, yeah, there is one installation I should have added, but uh, it's not here. It's already too many things. Uh, so, uh, for example, um, this one, Emotion Wins, uh, it's coming from data, coming from the, uh, from the web, 3,200 cities. And I, I measure the dominant emotion. And here the emotions are converted into a kind of uh, particle scene, moved by the real wind. So this is a, this is four emotions and eight different winds, different times, and the winds coming from the scientific uh, website, and uh, something like 100,000 queries to get the information of uh, relation between cities and emotions. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Could you download, you download I, a little bit the sound of the video? Ah, the sound is too high. The interpreter okay. can't. Okay. You okay. Your for interpretation when is you are better? talking, meanwhile, you. Uh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I'm sorry. As I hear nothing. <laughs> Thank you. Is it better like that? Yes, because it's very loud. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. So it's just, uh, I have to speed up a bit because otherwise you will. So this is emotion forecast is a different thing, but using exactly the same data. Uh, so I, I thought it would be interesting to have the equivalent of, uh, of the weather forecast where uh, I could present the emotional state of the world today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow. So uh, this is this was presented for the first time 2011, and then it has been presented in a, in, a, in a, I don't know 15 20 countries. Uh, so the first one was uh, here during Fiat, so next to Grand Palais. Uh, I like the Eiffel Tower behind that kind of kitschy thing, thinking. And as you can see, the aesthetic model is Bloomberg TV. Uh, we, need, uh, we need references, and uh, so that was my reference. Uh, because I want to compare the emotional, st the stock, financial stock, and, and, uh, uh, and the uh, human factor side by side. And here, I assume it would be great to have on TV every day instead of a weather report. What is the emotional state of the world today? So uh, some people try to do it, honestly. They offered me to try that. So you see, this was uh, October 2011. So we saw this one already. Occupy was screen was in 2012 in New York. Uh, so I put so, side by side uh, the emotion of the world, uh, the emotional state, and on the right, the financial stock. And it was generated automatically. Uh, so even the image in behind was generated automatically from the web. And this was close to uh, Broadway and not far from, uh, from Wall Street. So it was called Occupy Wall Screens. In uh, the same year in December, I presented in Seoul, uh, Escape Today. Uh, that was on a, 
Oh. Oh, this is not the video. Oh, it's much more interesting with the video. Let me find the video. <laughs> uh, so escape, the, it, it was a program about, about uh, landscape. And I said, oh, I will do emo emotion landscape. Uh, and uh, I propose to do uh, emotion landscape, of course. Uh, but uh, then I discovered the resolution was so low uh, that I should uh, let's try this. Oh, I have to I have to change my my sharing. Stop sharing. Uh, oh, okay. A new share. Sorry, I have to say, uh, no, it's not this one. New share, start again. Yeah, next time I will, <laughs> I will clean up my, my desktop, my uh, laptop. Uh, I admit that it this uh, looks a bit messy. Uh, maybe this one. So this is 100 meters by 100 meters, very low resolution, in front of uh, Seoul Station, the main station of Seoul. And so I displayed the same thing that, um, that uh, uh, occupy wall screens. And uh, the interesting thing is the soundtrack. Because it was at Christmas time. And so this is, this is the Salvation Army. Uh, that was recorded at the same time, so it didn't have to make uh, any specific soundtrack. Uh, this fits perfectly. And uh, of course, when the people owning the, the screen saw the content, they say, we cannot show that. And I say, too late. <laughs> so anyway, okay, I, I won't tell you the detail, but uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, yeah. So I have to, I have to stop that and go back to my slide if I find them. Oh, I have to speed up. Sorry. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna seriously speed up. Otherwise, we never get there. So. The Open Sky project, I started it in 2014. Uh, first with the work we created uh, with uh, Jeff Reshaw, uh, and we asked uh, uh, Jim Campbell to make a project for the ICC Tower in Hong Kong. It's uh, the highest tower in Hong Kong, 480 meters, but with a very low resolution uh, urban screen. Uh, that means 140 lines, which means one line, one floor and uh, black and white. And it used to be the biggest uh, screen in the world because we have three sides and 77,000 square meter. Okay, there is something. Uh, um, it's not eternal occurrence, it's eternal recurrence. So this is, uh, so this is a work um, Jane, uh, Jim Campbell did, and uh, it was displayed every night during two hours and a half during one month. And it, it was terribly successful, uh, because at this tower is seen by two million people at the same time. 
So it's like a, a big uh, TV program, you know. And and there is no advertising on the tower. It's only, uh, uh, I think we created the only art program on this tower, but they had nothing else. Only only terrible animation. So that's uh, uh, Jim Campbell's work. And what I wanted to show you here, do we have something here? I don't know. Okay. No, that, uh, I don't know which one is this one. So it became the Open Sky project where uh, I discussed with the people owning the tower to have content inviting artists and creating the Open Sky campus. So my MFA students could make projects on this tower, which is not bad, honestly, for a student. Uh, and, and some got a lot of benefit of having this kind of video to show and to say, oh, you know, when I was 22, I used to have uh, my content on the biggest, it was the highest tower in Asia uh, when it was built. So that's uh, it's not nothing. So, okay, then there, there are plenty of things with different quality, different interests. Uh, but this was the very first. And then we organized during this year a, a, big, uh, a big program, uh, inviting people to submit videos. Uh, we had an international jury of 12 people, 12 curators, including uh, very well-known international curators. And so 27 projects have been selected and six were the, uh, the top projects, including one, the, the two top projects were one of my students, one of uh, uh, Christa and Laurent, which is, uh, which is uh, not bad. I was happy for both of them. The thing became more complicated. Uh, in 2016, when we organized ASEA, uh, one of the works presented in another event that I invited on the tower uh, was a project made by two artists uh, that actually presented, presented a project as one minute of friendship. And then we discovered that, so you can see the full video here. Um, so this is Samsung Wong and Jason Lam presented this work and at the last minute they uh, modified the end of the work calling it Countdown Machine. And it was supposed to be a countdown to the year 2047, when Hong Kong go back to China. So this was okay because uh, I, I know the curators were uh, more or less aware of that. Uh, but the problem is that during the night, they, um, they contacted the New York Times, CNN, and everybody, let's say, on the American territory. And, and, and so a lot of articles have been written about the provocation it was and so on. So it, it became the big thing. That uh, so-called countdown. I say so-called because it cannot be a countdown uh, because we can only show videos, not uh, programs. So it would be the same numbers every day. And so this is the, the artist who made the ad oil machine thing uh, dur during the umbrella movement. And it was really great. They did this, uh, they projected messages sent by the, uh, from all over the world on the administration, on the um, government building. Uh, so the, uh, to understand the context, this is Hong Kong skyline on the island side. This is the advertising surface. This is the Hong Kong skyline on the Kowloon side, which is the opposite. And this is the advertising space. And this is the tower. So actually during two years and a half, we have given to the artists the possibility to express themselves on this tower with no competitors in a way because it's so big compared to the other. And this, this program has, of course, been stopped immediately. 
uh, and uh, the, the uh, biennial of urban media art that I we did before uh, was canceled. And uh, all the programs related to media art in Hong Kong have been canceled. So the consequence of uh, this uh, one minute uh, with an interpretation based on media attention had only one political impact, except that uh, the, uh, the, the uh, Americans love the story of the provocation against China and so on. But it's not, it was not a revelation, of course, because the date of 2047, uh, everybody knows it. Uh, but the, we wrote an article uh, with, with uh, uh, Lisa Park that uh, is published now in Leonardo on paper. It was published first in, a, but it's a new version on, on the paper version uh, about what we call, we call the media bait and the planned censorship. So you do something, what is important is the media attention you get uh, the, uh, and you plan the censorship in order to uh, appear as a matter. But the consequence, the political consequence of the thing uh, is not, you're not changing anything politically speaking, but you're destroying uh, all the context in which you do that. So all the students, all the artists that were invited at their work stopped. They couldn't prevent them. They had no, nothing written, no video about them. Uh, they're everything, I mean, the first victims have been the artists. And, and this program has been stopped. It took years to, to install. Uh, it has been working for two years and a half. We had more than 100 artists presenting words and this was canceled. So it was a big debate and I, I hope our text is uh, pretty, cautious about how we can understand the interests of uh, urban provocation and so on. But the problem is there is for us a big difference between projecting messages on a government building and getting a video in an artist program where all the artist program will be canceled. <laughs> so it's just, uh, yeah, something that deserves to be discussed. So uh, I, I cannot tell more about, because it takes time, uh, more about how we work with the student, but we created a, a website called, um, uh, called uh, Open Sky Campus uh, with all the tools to make the project. It's very easy. It's a black and white, and we, may, we put a simulator and so on. And that was really great. And uh, we, we had plenty of uh, interesting projects. So part three, uh, I have what left? Uh, that's the most recent part. So for me, it's more important to talk about that. And, uh, but I, I know yeah, some wanted to have more about the previous part. So this is about transactional art. And it's about the grand narrative behind the humankind technological frenzy which for me oscillates uh, between sublimation when the physical world is converted into data. Uh, we can talk about uh, dataism or, uh, you know, sublimation chemistry, like uh, going from solid state to uh, gas state uh, without going through liquid. And so imagine this is a, the fact that all the world is converted into, uh, into units, into uh, abstractions that the human brain or computer brain can interpret. And the second one is the reification, the conversion of objects, uh, of uh, abstractions, ideas into objects. So the Brain Factory started in 2016, 16, sorry, <laughs> 60s, uh, between sublimation and reification, between data and matter. So they are not going to show you this. No. 
So it's a bit of artificial life, um, evolutionist model, natural selection ecosystem, morphogenesis, and so on. Uh, so the idea is that attraction exists in our brain, uh, but we don't necessarily uh, know what is the shape of the attraction. For example, if I say time, space, what is the space, the shape of time and the, the shape of space or the shape of power or the shape of love, we don't know. And so um, the, the thing is to use an EEG headset to be in front of a screen with uh, a particle generator that start generating, uh, start generating shapes. And then you have a world given, here it's space, and, and you have to react, to assess, to curate the evolution of the shape according to your mental ecosystem. Uh, to find, we want your brain to find how this thing could become space. What is interesting, this was the first attempt. Honestly, it's the best one because this is what we got at the end that corresponds to two definitions of space. So we created plenty of, uh, plenty of shapes, thousands, and related to abstractions. And then sometime we reified them and converting them into objects and to 3D printing. So it's kind of a vanity uh, where, uh, where uh, the abstract thing becomes an object. So it becomes dead in a way. And this is a different kind of reification that could come from that. So people could use the model to create specific sculpture like democracy here with a honeycomb. And this is a big reificator and I'm not telling you more. And value of values, that's a very new project uh, where we use exactly the same approach, but based only on uh, human values and not all the abstractions. So it's finance versus ethics, speculative speculations on the values. So we have been working with uh, Tobias Klein and Nicolas Mendoza. Tobias Klein is more about 3D. Uh, he made sculpture and artworks with 3D printing. He is an architect. And Nicolas Mendoza made a PhD thesis about about uh, blockchain and amulet, uh, Thai amulets. So usually blockchain art is about marketing. It's not about producing something specific. Uh, here we wanted uh, the blockchain to be the medium. And so we selected 42 human values and that become tokens at the end of the process. So the, during the show, the spectator become an artist, a curator, and then at the end can become a collector and an art dealer. And so the, at the end of the process, the token is recorded to the blockchain and uh, the, oh, sorry. Oh, I have a, I missed one page, yeah. So you can decide to trade it. For example, you exchange, you barter a piece, 404 for love 0002 and, and love 002, so peace and love for money. And this defines the relative value of the values. So what people are ready to pay or to barter for uh, will determine the value of the values. So what is interesting is that with transaction, you know what is the relative value of the values and of course, you have a lot of charts and things like that to know how to invest in values. But the, one of the interesting things, there are apps, of course. One of the interesting things is that when you, when you, make, uh, when you barter something, like uh, uh, I wanted sex, I gave you money, for example. This becomes what I call transactional poetry. 
Transactional poetry is a translation of the transaction into sentences that could be understood as statements, ethical statements or poetry. So this is coming from transaction. It's not something totally arbitrary. It's really coming from transaction, but of course the way the wording uh, is arbitrary. So then this, is a, this is a project for urban screens. And so uh, the idea is to display that, that are uh, transactional poetry. And when you make photo, when you make photos, uh, of Times Square, for example, you can see the text. But, but if you don't, you don't know what it is about. So, yeah, other things about, that was a launching in June, last June, uh, of VOV, Value of Values. Uh, it was a public IVO, international value, uh, sorry, initial value offering. And this is uh, the first the first token that was actually uh, the happiness zero, 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 zero. And Lee De Jong, this was in uh, Isaiah last year. Uh, I mean, in June and July, a presentation with two chairs. This was Macerata in Italy, uh, where it was possible, of course, to press it as well. And this was Mocha Taipei, and I will end with that uh, in October where we had three stations and uh, people could contribute. So when you do the process, you own the token at the end and you can start trading. Hi, Maurice, I've been- Yeah, uh, I stop here. <laughs> I've been given the nod to stop you here. Uh, yeah, exactly where I stop. Yeah, but I could listen all afternoon. This was, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> It's yeah, but I mean, I, I, all night for me. <laughs> yes, and I'd, I'd better be very careful not to talk myself. It's it's a fantastic body of work. It's amazing. There's, there's a Brazilian term by a Brazilian theatre director, because I'll always pull it back to theatre directing, uh, called Augusto Boal. And because his work is very participa participatory, he doesn't like to call people spectators. He calls them spect actors. And um, it, it just becomes very much aware to me that we need a similar term for the people who engage with your art. Um, you, you, you know, I met Augusto Boal yeah, and I, yeah. I, I, I did a workshop with him and I mention yeah. him very often with my students in terms of uh, interaction mm. uh, because uh, he used to do a very um, amazing work. Yeah, incredible work. But I mean, your, your work is so... To understand interaction, it's perfect. Yeah. It, it's so interactive, it's so playful, it's so fun, and, and the meaning is so clear to those who observe it, you know, yeah. that you, it, it, it's instantly, the, you get instant gratification out of getting it. You don't need to have studied art history um, to understand uh, the point of the artwork. Thank, thank you so much for this. I don't know whether Justin wants to say something very quickly before we wrap up, if, just, if Justin's there. I'm used to that. <laughs> yeah, you know, academic just silence. People, where to start? <laughs> yeah, and I think it's 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 even older online um, doing these doing these kind of events. Um, I think Dalma wants to move us along to the next thing, but I think on behalf of everyone, um, and I certainly want to talk to you more in the future as well. But that was absolutely fantastic, beautiful work. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry, Justin just Thank said he you. can't, Thank he can't you. unmute himself. For that, some that's reason. very nice. And uh, I, yeah. I, I, I didn't. Uh, Thank you so much, Marvin. We are on time for the yeah. next lecture. Okay. Yeah. I understand. Thank you very much, Dema. Thank you, Dom. Thank you. Have Morris. a nice uh, afternoon. Will do. Thank and, you. Uh, and, <laughs> enjoy for the, the next talks. time. And I, I'm still on the same glass. So. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> but I. Uh, I yeah. switched to something else, otherwise it would have been difficult. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.